Welcome everyone. So today I'm going to tell you about a very nice proof of the Yuan Alenju and Yuanju Li about the limitations of kernel methods. I will uh, mention something about uh, deep learning, how this result separates kernels from deep learning, but it will in fact be much simpler than that. So to start off, let me explain uh, what we mean by kernel methods. So we're going to start with a definition definition so a kernel method is simply a linear model is a linear model after an embedding after an embedding into a hilbert space so phi is going to go from rd to h Okay, so we're going to be in a machine learning setting where our input, our training data is a bunch of points in RD. And what the kernel method is going to do is that it's going to map those points in RD to a certain abstract Hilbert space H. And then in that Hilbert space, it's doing a linear model. So let me say a bit more precisely what I mean. So uh, what I mean is that the method returns, it returns, point f in the Hilbert space h so that the prediction sorry about that the prediction on a new point x on a new input x is going to be given by y so what is going to be y? y is going to be a linear function. So f is a linear function. But f is a linear function over h. So what I need to do is to first embed my input x, which is in Rd, into h. So my output y is really f, you know, the inner product of f and phi of x in h. So this is my, my model. Okay, I take an image, I map it through the mapping phi, and then in uh, the embedded space, I have a linear function. Okay, that's what is a kernel method. And what I'm going to say is that the method uses n samples if it, it chooses endpoints xi in Rd i from 1 to n okay so how you choose those xi i make no assumption about that and then it receives the method uses n sample if it chooses the xi's in rd uh, n of them and upon receiving yi's okay so a label for each of these endpoints it returns some f in h, but more specifically, it's going to be in the span of the phi of xi. That is what a kernel method on n data points is doing. Okay, so it's not outputting any arbitrary linear function in h, it's outputting something which is specifically in the span of the embedded point. Okay, and what, what is the, the meaning of this? Uh, typically, this happens if you do a regularized empirical risk minimization. So typically what the kernel method does is that it returns the arg min of the following, the sum for i equals 1 to n of the difference between yi, okay, the target label, and what our function f would predict on xi. So what would our function f predict on xi? It would predict the inner product of f and phi of xi. So you sum the errors that you're making if you were selecting f, and you add some regularization term, plus lambda times the norm of f, the norm of course in h squared. Okay, this is what support vector machines are doing. This is a typical uh, empirical risk, regularized empirical risk minimization, okay? And in particular, it's very easy to see that the solution to this problem is in the span of the phi of xi. Why is that? Well, you see the, uh, risk minimization part, it only matters what is f in the span of the phi of xi. 
Okay, orthogonal to the span of phi of xi, this has no contribution to, to these terms. And on the other hand, the regularization term forces you that, you know, if there is no point in adding something uh, for prediction because it's orthogonal to all of the phi of xi, then you shouldn't include it because otherwise it would increase uh, the, the total energy, it would increase the norm of f in h. Okay, so that's what we mean by a kernel method. A kernel method is simply specified by uh, phi, the embedding function, then it's specified by a scheme to select the data point xi. Okay, so that's a little bit different from the usual supervised learning scenario where the xi are assumed to be iid. Here I'm assuming that you can uh, select them, you can choose them. Then you receive some labels yi, and upon receiving these yi's, you build a model. Okay, that's what is going to be a kernel method. And what we're going to prove today, uh, following the proof of uh, Zeyuan Alenju and Yuan Juli, is that these methods are very limited. So, you know, we often hear, at least from theoreticians, that they want to try to see how far can the kernel methods go, you know, can they catch up with deep learning, et cetera, et cetera. So of course, any neural network, once it's trained, it corresponds to a certain kernel. But it doesn't mean that for any new task, it suffices to apply a certain kernel method. You know, maybe deep learning really goes beyond kernel methods, and that's what we're going to prove today. Okay, very good. So the theorem that uh, we're going to prove is the following. So Zeyuan and Yuanju do not uh, phrase it like this, but I, it doesn't matter. I'm going to attribute it to them, obviously. Uh, so Zeyuan, Alenju, and Yuanju, uh, 2020. Okay, so there exists a class of functions. Let's call it a concept class. Okay, so C, which is going to be uh, a certain set of functions from Rd to R. So these are the label functions. Such that the following holds true. So first of all, um, there exists a class of function C and a distribution mu on Rd, such that the following holds true. So first of all, kernel methods cannot get non-trivial accuracy on this problem. So what I mean is for any kernel method, so again, a kernel method, it's both an embedding, uh, an embedding, a way to choose the xi, and then a mapping from the labels, okay, yi's, which in this case would be labeled according to some target function c, to a function f in the span of the phi of xi. So for any kernel method, if the kernel method is good, meaning that for any concept in my concept class c, given yi equals c of xi. So notice in particular here, I'm assuming no noise. Okay, so the kernel method has access to a training set, which is perfectly labeled according to the uh, concept uh, c. So given y, i, it returns f. in uh, h such that, so what do I want? I want to assume that the error that my linear model makes now uh, in the embedded space is small. So namely, the expectation on a new point x sampled from mu of the difference between c of x, so the true label, and the label that we predict, so the inner product of f and phi of x in h. Okay, the expectation of the square of this error is smaller than some constant, let's say one ninth. Okay, and one ninth will just be a, a nice constant for the rest of the proof. Okay, very good. So I'm assuming that I have a kernel method which is good for this function class C. Then I claim that this implies for this particular problem that n is going to be exponential in D. Namely, it's going to be uh, 2 to the d minus 1. Okay, so this function class that 
I'm going to explain in the proof, I'm going to construct, on this distribution mu, you cannot learn it with kernel methods. Okay, you need an exponential number of samples. Okay, very good. So that's, that's obviously very easy to construct. But the second point is that, on the other end, there exists a simple, and I will explain what it is, a simple two-step procedure such that it returns, it actually returns C with high probability given N is larger than D. Okay, so using only D samples, okay, so very far from, from exponential in D, just D samples, it can actually return the concept C uh, with high probability. And moreover, this procedure is robust to noise. Okay, so this is a very important point. Not only can I find this procedure that uh, using only a linear number of samples or a polynomial number of samples, it can identify the concept and, and thus have zero error, but also this procedure can, can also work if there is noise in the labels. So if there is noise in the labels, you know, whether it's flip noise, let's say if it's classification, or if it's Gaussian noise, if it's regression, it doesn't matter for this problem. Um, what you're going to need is you're going to need a little bit more than D, maybe polynomial in D, but it's not going to be exponential. Okay, so I'm not cheating, cheating in any way. So as far as I know, this theorem, as uh, stated, is new. I don't know, but I would be very interested if somebody uh, knows an earlier reference or, or a different proof for it. So for instance, if there wasn't this N moreover uh, part in the second point, then the theorem would follow from the very classical result of Blum et al. from 94, showing that uh, learning parity uh, without noise is what's called statistical query hard. Okay, so kernel methods are uh, statistical query algorithms. So if you can show uh, that a certain problem is statistical query hard, then you show that kernel methods cannot do it, which is the case for parity without noise. But it's also known that parity without noise, you can very simply learn it. It's, it's just a linear, uh, a linear system problem. But learning parity with noise is very hard, okay, in the classical IID machine learning setting. The point is, here we have this twist that we allow here, we are allowed to choose the X size on which we, we, we get uh, the labels. So that will make a huge difference. Okay, and this is what will allow us to, in fact, solve parity with noise for this example. And then we will show that uh, basically that parity cannot be learned with kernel methods, even if you can choose the X size. Okay, so that's uh, the plan. Uh, let me also say one more thing, which is in this example, you see mu, the distribution mu, is given to you as part of the problem. So you know it, which means that for this problem, unsupervised learning cannot help. Okay, so it's not like you cannot say, I'm going to get a bunch of XIs without the label, learn a good, la a good kernel based on this XIs, and then uh, my kernel method is going to work. This is probably ruled out by uh, this theorem. Okay. Another point that I want to make is the key point of the Alan Zhu and Lee paper is that they construct a slightly different example where they show that, in fact, not only there is a simple two-step procedure, but in fact, stochastic gradient descent on their network can learn uh, this problem. Okay, so they really give a problem where kernel methods cannot do it, while uh, SGD on our networks can do it, thus showing a separation between uh, deep learning and kernel methods. But here we're going to be, um, uh, we're going to have a, a much smaller goal, a less ambitious goal, which is just going to be to separate kernel methods from you know, a very simple hierarchical, in some way, two-step uh, procedure. Okay, so let's jump into the construction. So the construction is, in fact, uh, going to be parity. So let's do it. So mu is going to be a uniform distribution on the discrete hypercube on minus 1, 1 to the d. 
And my function class C is going to be the set of parity function, meaning C S of X. So S is going to be a subset of uh, the indices 1 through D. So C S of X is just going to be the product for I in S of the XI. Okay, S is a subset of 1 through D. Okay, so we call this parity because you see it's just, you know, plus 1 times plus 1 times minus 1. So you just have to count how many plus 1 and how many minus 1 do you have in the set S. And that's going to tell you whether it's a plus 1 or a minus 1. Okay, so it's a parity of this vector X, parity in the set S. So that's the set of functions uh, that we want to learn. So why is it easy? So let me just, why is it easy to, to learn? So point two. I said it's just a linear system because you can really think about it. The C S is really the indicator of the set S inner product with X, but this is the inner product in GF2, okay, in the Galois field of size two. Okay, so it's just this. So what, what you have is you have the indicator of S dot XI equals YI. And you have n of those. So you just need to check the, the rank of the system given by the xi. Okay, you just need to show that the system is full rank, meaning that you can invert it, full rank in GF2, and this is very easy to do. Now, the problem is solving this problem via uh, a, a linear system is not going to be robust to noise. Okay, if the yi's, they can be flipped with some small probability, then you never know, uh, you know, which equations you can trust and which you can't trust. So we believe that if the xi's are iid, it is actually computationally hard uh, to, to learn this problem, to get a small error. But the point is that here we get to choose the xi. So what we can do is that we can just pick a basis or, or you know, uh, an independent set in the hypercube and just repeat every, every xi that we want to have many, many times. So we can just average out the noise. That's, that's really no problem. So really, point two is clear. We are able to learn this by basically averaging and then solving a linear system. So that's a two step. First, you average, and then you, you solve a linear system. And what I'm going to show now is that uh, kernel methods cannot do that. OK, so, so let's do it. So an important note is that C, the function class C, the set of, of this function, is a basis for the set of function f from the hypercube to the reals. OK, why is that? Well, this set of function, it's a vector space okay, of dimension 2 to the d, because for every you know, point in the hypercube, you assign a, a scalar. So this is a vector space of size 2 to the d. C is of size 2 to the d, so the only thing that I need to show is that it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, they are independent. And how do I prove that? So it's very simple. It's going to be an orthonormal basis, actually, for the inner product, which is given by the distribution mu, meaning the expectation of the inner product. So what is the inner product? It's C s of x times C s prime of x. Okay, so this is the expectation when x is sampled from mu. There is no prime here. This is either 0 if s is not equal to s prime, and it's 1 if s is equal to s prime, okay, meaning it's exactly an orthonormal system. So why is that? Uh, let's see. So if they are not equal, then it means that there is at least one coordinate which is present in one of them, but not in the other one. So we, if we just integrate over that one coordinate, you know, sometimes it's going to be with plus one, half of the time it's going to be with plus one, half of the time it's going to be with minus one. So it's exactly going to cancel each, you know, it's going to cancel out and it's going to give me zero. On the other hand, if s is equal to s prime, then every term appears twice. So I get xi squared all the time, but xi squared is always one. So I get always a product of one, so I get one. Okay. So C, the set of, of, of parity function, is uh, not a normal basis uh, for the set of function from the discrete hypercubes to the reals. So this is important because what do we want to do in the proof? What we want is, right, this is going to be our assumption. Our assumption is that we have a function, 
a linear function in the embedded space, which has small error. Oops, sorry about that. Stay with this now. So it's, it's going to be a, a function, a linear function in the embedded space, which has small error. Okay. So what I need is to be able to understand this uh, error term, this L2 error. And now I can very, very easily understand it in terms of these parity function. Why is that? So the goal is going to be uh, to compute. What do we want to compute? We want to compute the expectation of C, uh, Cs. Let's call it C s star. Okay, s star is going to be the truth of x minus f times pi of x. Okay, this is what we want to compute. Square of this. Okay, but it's very convenient because we know that the CS are not a normal basis for this inner product. Okay. So what am I going to do? So f. We know that it's in the span of the phi of xi, meaning that f can be written as the sum of ai times phi of xi. Okay. Now you see the the function x maps to um, phi of xi in a product with phi of x. Right, this is a kernel really. This is a kernel evaluated at xi x. This function, it's a function from the discrete hypercube to the reals. So, this function, I can write it as a certain sum of lambda i s c s of x. Right, I can decompose it in the orthonormal basis given by the parity function. So, what this means is that this f is just, you know, this was a sum over i for i equals 1 to n. This is really a sum over s included in d, sum over i from 1 to n of ai lambda i s c s. Um, what I mean, sorry about that, what I really mean is that f in a product with phi of x, this thing is equal to this. Okay, so now coming back to this thing, okay, my L2 error. So my L2 error now, I know that it's equal to the expectation when x is sampled from mu of what? of c s star of x minus the sum over s the sum over i a i lambda i s c s of x squared which just by decomposing by by opening up the square this is going to be one minus the sum over i of ai lambda i s star square. Okay, so this is a term in this decomposition that corresponds to s equals s star. And then I have all the other terms plus the sum for s not equal to s star of the sum for i equals 1 to n of ai lambda i s squared. Okay, so this is what I have. This is a key identity. All right, so this is my L2 error using simply the fact uh, that I have a, that the parity functions are a basis for the inner product given by the uniform distribution on the hypercube. Okay, so now let's equipped with this formula, let's prove uh, point point one. Sorry, so now. Proof of one. So remember, what is our assumption? Okay, so sorry, let me go back up. So our assumption is that we have fixed the kernel method, so we have fixed this embedding, and 
we have fixed it so that for any concept, so for any parity, we can return a function which has small L2 error. Okay? So we can return a function, meaning we can find those AI. So the assumption, so by assumption, for any S star, okay, which is a true uh, subset on which we're taking the parity, there exists a i s star, okay, such that f, which is the sum of a i s star pi of x i, has L2 error, maybe let's be L2 error smaller than one night. That's our assumption, okay, sum for i equals 1 to n. And the L2 error, we just wrote it here. Okay, so we have two terms. If the sum of the two is smaller than one nine, then both of them are smaller than one nine. So what does it mean? So this implies that one minus the sum for i equals one to n of a i s star lambda i s star square is smaller than one nine. And the sum for s not equal to s star. So the, the contribution from all of those terms, which are not the true subset, is also small. So the sum for i equals 1 to n of a i s star lambda i s squared is also smaller than 1. And the question is, can we conclude from that, that our goal, that n is larger than 2 to the d minus 1? Okay, that's, that's what we want to prove. So all I'm going to do now is that I'm going to rewrite these two inequalities uh, using matrix notation. And then we will see that a certain rank argument is going to give us the lower bound. Okay, so let's, let's do it. So notation. Why is going to be the matrix notation useful? Because you see the sum of AIS star lambda IS you can view it as you know, an entry in a matrix multiplication. So more precisely, let me denote lambda SI. Okay, sorry about that. Lambda SI. So this lambda, this is going to be a 2 to the D times N matrix. So the entry of this guy are going to be the lambda IS. Okay, remember the lambda IS are the coefficient in the decomposition of the kernel at the data points. Okay, so this is given by the function phi and the data point xi. And let me introduce the matrix A, which is going to be uh, n by 2 to the d. Okay, so the entry i, and let's say s star, this is going to be a i s star, which are the coefficient that my kernel method is finding to get low error. So you see, sum for i equals 1 to n of a i s star lambda i s is just the entry s s star of the product lambda times a. Okay, so let me define omega to be lambda times a. Okay, so this is a matrix which is of size 2 to the d by 2 to the d of rank n because it's lambda times a and the inner dimension is n. Okay, so we know that the rank of this uh, matrix, or let's, yeah, rank, let's say, smaller than n. Okay. Very good. And now, again, what is this term? This term is just omega, and let me see if I do it correctly. This is omega of S star. And what is this term? This term is just omega of S star S star. Okay, so this big matrix omega of size 2 to the d by 2 to the d, what do we know about it? We know, so we know that 1 minus omega s star s star squared is smaller than 1 ninth, and the sum for s not equal to s star of omega. Uh, let me just see, SS star 
doesn't really matter, squared, this is also smaller than one ninth. So we have this big matrix, and we know the diagonal entries here, diagonal, they are all larger than two thirds. Okay? Because we know that the distance to one is smaller than one ninth square, so the distance to one is smaller than one third. So certainly omega s, s, s star s star is larger than two thirds. So we have this matrix where the diagonal elements are big. And what else do we know? We know, so okay, so this element is big, is larger than two thirds. And we know that the sum, you know, for instance, on this row of all these other terms, so the sum square, the sum of squares, squared entry of diagonal, this is smaller than uh, one ninth. Okay, so just to be clear, if it was the sum of the absolute value, okay, if it was the sum of those terms is actually smaller than, uh, than the diagonal term, then this is called diagonal dominance. Okay, it would be a diagonally dominant matrix, and then we would know that if it, it's full rank. Okay, so without without this diagonal dominance would say omega is full rank. which means the rank of omega would be equal to 2 to the d, okay, the size. But we know that the rank is smaller than n. We said it because we have, you know, a decomposition uh, uh, into a 2 to the d times n by times n by 2 to the d matrix. So this would show that n is larger than 2 to the d. Okay, and that's the end of it. This would, this would complete the proof. So what we need is a kind of L2 version of diagonal dominance, where the diagonal entry is not larger than the sum of diagonal, but it's larger than the sum of the square of diagonal, and it's larger by a certain gap. Okay, so we need a L2 type diagonal dominance. And this is also turns out to be true, you're not going to get full rank, but you're going to get that the rank is uh, a constant fraction of what it's possible. So let's, let's see how to do it. So, okay, so omega, I'm going to write it as the diagonal of omega. Okay, so all this term on the diagonal, which is larger than two thirds. Okay, so all entries larger than two thirds plus the rest, which I'm going to call omega prime. Okay, so this is of diagonal term. And what do we know? We know that the Frobenius norm of omega prime, okay, the Frobenius norm, the sum of the squares of the entry of diagonal, this is, you know, on every row, it's less than one ninth, and we have two to the d rows, so this is smaller than 2 to the d over 9. But we also know that the Frobenius norm squared is the sum of the eigenvalue squared. So this is the sum of the eigenvalue of omega prime squared. So what does it mean? It means that omega prime cannot have too many large eigenvalues. In particular, it cannot have too many lar eigenvalues larger than 2 thirds. Okay, so this implies that omega prime has at most at most 2 to the d over 4 eigenvalues uh, larger than 2 thirds. Okay, let's say in absolute value. Why is that? Well, if it had more than 2d over 4 eigenvalues larger than 2 thirds, then the sum of the square would be what? Well, we have 2 over 3 uh, squared, so that's 4 over 9, times 2 to the d over 4, so that's 2 to the d over 9, okay? So if we had more than 2 to the d over 4 eigenvalues larger than 2 thirds, then the sum of the square would be larger than 2 to the d over 9, which is not true. 
So now we know that omega prime has at most two to the d over four eigenvalues larger than two thirds. But now on the subspace, orthogonal to those eigenvalues, large eigenvalues where, so it's the subspace where the eigenvalues are small, then we know that omega prime, you know, it has an effect of getting an entry, like, okay, let me maybe just write the inequality. So what it means, so this implies on the subspace of eigenvalues for omega prime, you know, smaller than two thirds, which is of dimension this subspace, we know that it's of dimension larger than three fourths times two to the d. Okay, because there are at most two to the d over four uh, directions where uh, where the um, sorry there are at most two to the d over four directions where the eigenvalues are larger than two thirds. So on the subspace, which is of dimension at least three fourths times two to the d, where the eigenvalues are small, what do we have? We have that omega times x, okay, the norm of omega times x, x is in the subspace. On the subspace, let's call it v. So x in v. What is this? This is uh, you know the norm of diag of omega times x plus omega prime times x. So this is larger than the norm of diag of omega times x by the triangle inequality minus the norm of omega prime times x. Now this, because we're on this subspace of small eigenvalues, we know that this is smaller than two third times the norm of x. But this thing, the diagonal element of omega, they are all larger than two thirds. Okay, so the effect of this is larger than basically two thirds times the identity. So this is larger than two thirds times the norm of x. So what we know is that this is strictly positive. Okay, uh, there is no critical point on the subspace V, meaning that the rank on V of omega is full. Okay, so this implies that the rank of omega is at least three fourths times two to the d. Okay, so we don't get quite full rank, which would be two to the d, but we get a constant uh, fraction of the full rank, and this implies that n is larger than three fourths times two to the d, because the rank of omega was smaller than n, uh, given the decomposition in the definition of omega. Okay, and that that concludes the proof. So I would be very curious if somebody knows a, a reference or if this type of argument has appeared before. Um, and that's it for today. Thank you very much.